Well, all right, everybody. Welcome on back here to Simple Faith Baptist Church, where the Bible changes us. We don't change the Bible. Or rather, I was going to say, welcome on back here to Simple Faith Baptist Church, where Jesus saves us. The mask doesn't. No, I'm just kidding. Anyways, everybody, just want to thank you for tuning in with us here this evening. Hope and pray all is well. Okay, the audio sounds good. Praise God. Uh, we're going to go and go over some cool and fun announcements before we get started. And uh, if you would, please do me a favor and redirect your attention to the screen. If you're watching online somewhere over here in this area, you're going to see all of our information that we're going to cover here this evening. And so uh, please uh, uh, bear with me as I try to get some last minute technical difficulties uh, started here. So just bear with me now <clears throat> this evening here. Sorry, we're having some minor technical difficulties here. All right, almost ready to go. Almost here. Okay, praise God. Okay, friends, well, here we are at, uh, at uh, church here at Simple Faith Baptist Church. We are located in Oceanside, California, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, we are currently having our midweek Bible study fellowship, and uh, we are here today we're going to cover some announcements before we continue with Midweek Fellowship. If you would, direct your attention to the screen. We're just going to go over some quick and fun announcements here. We're located at 1836 Dixie Street in Oceanside, California. We are currently renting from the Friendly Church of God in Christ. We are renting the side space. Look out for the signs. If you ever do want to come by and physically fellowship, our signs will redirect you here to our location. If you need to uh, see some address, you'll see our address here typed in, and you can actually click on that hyperlink, and thankfully you'll see uh, some pretty cool uh, directions there as well, email address and phone. Our current schedule is on Sunday. We have a Sunday school starting at 1 p.m., and then we have our Sunday service at 1.45 p.m., and then we have our midweek Bible study, of which I'm currently giving announcements for here at 7 p.m., and so let's go ahead and click on some cool fun tabs so you guys can get to learn a little bit more about us. You can click about us here, our beliefs church team. We're going to go ahead and click on this prayer tab because this here is the most important announcement, I believe, out of everything else that we're going to talk about here this evening. And so here we have our prayer tab. What you can do, friend, is you can click here online whenever you have a moment and submit a prayer request right here on your right-hand side. You can do it anonymously or publicly. Just let us know. We'd love to pray with you and pray for you, uh, whatever it is that you're currently going through in life. Then we're going to go ahead and click here on our Get Connected on our current and future ministries. Currently for our church, friends, we are doing a Saturday soul win and outreach. That means every Saturday, by God's grace, around 3 p.m., we get together here at the church house. We pray. We get our scripture signs, as you guys can see, and we get our church flyers. And we get ready to go out and preach Jesus Christ here in our city. We want to let everybody know how much Jesus Christ loves them and what he desires to do for their life if they're willing to receive him as their Lord and Savior. And so keep us in prayer every Saturday. We hope to do that. And then, of course, Wednesday night Bible study fellowship. Our mission trip has been on hold for quite some time now, but we do look forward to getting back out there to Ensenada, Mexico one of these days. Then we're going to go in and click on this live stream tab as you guys can see here, we're only currently live streaming through three platforms. Number one is our Facebook church page. Number two is our YouTube live stream uh, on, our, on our YouTube channel. And then number three on our podcast channel. So what we do is we convert the video messages into MP3 so you can listen to some solid Bible preaching on your way to work, while you're working out, whatever you're doing without the visual. And uh, you can listen to our podcast channel as well. Okay, last two announcements here. We have our Bible study resources tab. This is very, very useful for tools to benefit your faith in regards to the knowledge of the Bible. We're not the only Bible-believing Baptist church in the world. There are many, many other great churches that have started of which we glean and of which we learn from as an example to follow. Here we have Chick.com and the Chick Ministry. We have Sweet Springs Baptist Church, Iglesia Bautista, all these phenomenal, great Bible-believing Baptist ministries to assist your knowledge in regards to God's Word and how everything like that uh, gets going. 
And then last but not least here, friends, on our giving, if you're a member of this church, hope you are, whatever you purpose in your heart between you and God, remain faithful. Or if you're a Christian watching me online, I hope you are faithfully attending a local Bible-based church near you. Hope you're supporting it with your finances as Jesus commanded you to do for the support of the local church. Whatever your purpose in your heart, you can do so online here or in-house by coming on by. Amen. Okay, so with that said, let's go ahead and get to the best part of tonight's fellowship, which is the Word of God Bible study. We're here to learn from God's Word, the Bible. Do me a favor, friends, for those of you who are here and those of you that are watching online, let's go ahead and turn in our King James Bible. That's right. Hope you have God's Word, God's, God's perfect Word there. Every verse contained, nothing missing, nothing omitted like the modern version. Go ahead, friend, and uh, open up your Bibles here to Genesis chapter number 6. Genesis chapter number 6. <clears throat> We're going to start here in Genesis chapter number 6. All right, friends, so we are here in Genesis chapter number 6. And uh, hopefully you are there tuning in with me. And for those of you guys that are online, pra praise God, the blessing of modern technology. I actually am able to get the Bible software for you so you're able to actually see it. For those of my members here, they're able to see the projector. And then for those that are watching online, they're able to see it. As a matter of fact, let me just quickly adjust this projector just to get a quick... Um, re I need to redo this image setting here. Give me one quick second here. Let's see if... We can get this a little bit brighter. There we go. There's a there's a little bit brighter screen. All right, we'll just leave it at that for now. Okay, hopefully that, that does it there. Okay, praise God. So Genesis chapter number 6. Let's go ahead and read together, and then we'll pray. All right, here the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 6, verse number 1, And it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown." The Bible says in verse number 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I want you to keep that in the back of your mind, friend, as we're studying along here. God said when he looked down on this planet thousands of years ago at a time in which uh, there was not modern technology like you and I have here today, that Bible says that God saw every thought and it was only evil, friends. So consider this here as we continue to move forward in our reading. Verse number six, Bible says, And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. You see, God does have a heart, friend. You can grieve it. We'll talk about that in a little bit. The Bible says in verse number seven, The Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing, and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. How about that, friend? That's the God of the Bible. He can choose to feel sad and say, man, I should not have created that. Look at what they're doing. You know what? I'm going to wipe them out. I'm going to completely destroy these creatures of mine that are living a life contrary to my standards. So keep that in mind as we move forward. Verse number eight. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. You see, throughout time, praise God, it is only by the characteristic of God's grace in which he extends mercy and pardon upon his creation whenever they reach out for it. So thank God for his grace and mercy. Amen. Verse 9, the Bible says, These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. What that shows you and I today, friend, without getting too much into it before we pray, is it's, it is completely available for men to be pleasing to God anytime. But when men decide to do what God has commanded and expected him to do, God will then respond with that relationship by, again, grace and mercy for forgiveness 
and justification. Noah clearly demonstrates that. And again, the New Testament will use him as an example, and we'll show you that in a few minutes. Verse number 10, Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So he had some children. Verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God. Now pay attention to this also. Look at what the Word of God said there earlier. Man, beast. Now, verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you once again, our Lord God, for allowing us to gather in the name of Jesus Christ, your only begotten Son. Father, I pray today that you would minister to our hearts through thy holy word, the Bible. I pray, God, your Holy Spirit would fill us and help us to have eyes to see and ears to hear wonderful things from thy holy word, the Scriptures, God. Please remove from our minds any distractions, God, today, any affairs of this life, any affairs of the world, anything, God, that is trying to blind us from the importance of the Holy Scriptures. I pray, God, that you would help us to concentrate. I want to thank you for the members of this church that came tonight. Thank you for them that are watching online, Lord. Please bless the marriages, the families, all those that are representing who, uh, their families and their own lives, God, before you, that you'd bless them by hearing your word taught. We thank you for this time now in Jesus' name. Amen. The title of tonight's message is The Land Being Defiled. The Land Became Defiled. Or rather, as I title it on our online titling, Because the Land Is Defiled, Present Tense. And I will exposit that as we move on in this verse. Now I start off tonight here with the Word of God found in the book of Genesis as a reminder of some of the things that are currently taking place here in my country, the United States of America. And I'm not too uh, relevant and topical as a preacher to give messages as it pertains to things taking place. However, every once in a while, I do get stirred my spirit because of what I see. And I want to consider God, the Bible, to say, God, where can I find your truth to help give clarification or light into the darkness of this world. So that way, God, your judgments and your statutes and your commandments might be superior than to man and man's standards. And thank God that we have a holy Bible that's been inspired and preserved. Thank God that he has exalted his, his word above his name. And thank God that although heaven and earth shall pass away, his words will not. So he has preserved his word throughout time. He has given me a perfect copy of it that I have here in my King James Bible, of which I can obtain wisdom, knowledge, and understanding of how to live in these present times. In our last Sunday service, we talked about a scripture verse in Philippians 2.15 in regards to the Christian and God's command for them to walk in light in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation that we are in, that God wants us to live a life of separation that would then display to the unbelieving world around us something different about our lives. Well, today, in regards to what has taken place, we see a rise in homosexuality. We see a rise in abominations of practices amongst people, be it young or old. Uh, we see abortion skyrocketing. We see pedophilia slowly but surely being accepted as a general uh, sexual orientation and feeling. You can research yourself on TED Talks, this German uh, a reprobate, uh, very satanic, uh, evil-spirited-filled individual that was promoting pedophilia as a natural sensation, and we should be accepting of those individuals that uh, don't take care of those wicked thoughts when they were young and obviously act upon it. We see a rise in sex trafficking amongst human beings. We see a rise in oppression and all these things. But I want to tell you, friend, it's not that the modern times are becoming any different. As a matter of fact, the Bible has been relevant for over 2,000 years. God said that this planet was so filled with wickedness and defilement and evil that he purposed within himself to judge the entire earth. God just told us in Genesis that all flesh has corrupted its way upon the earth, the beast and mankind. We see here that the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. And they didn't even have Facebook. And they did not even have YouTube, no social media. 
They didn't even have guns. They didn't have tanks and, and uh, all these modern warfare tactics. But they had a heart. They had a heart filled with sin because Adam and Eve, the first human beings made in God's image, were given a free will choice to either obey God's word by faith or reject God's word through rebellion. They chose to not listen to God and act upon their sensations to doubt God's word. And as a result, sin entered into human existence. And that sin in your heart, friend, in my heart is what's going to spring up within us these things called lusts and desires, vain imaginations, thoughts that are so wicked and evil that some of us tonight are even embarrassed to discuss and share maybe things you've thought of earlier today or things you've thought of or even done physically that is the thought going into action a long time ago. Well, God said a long time ago that when he looked upon this earth, it was so bad he repented that he had made man. You see, before we continue in our Bible verse-by-verse verse study, we're going to see here tonight that the Bible proves presuppositions and the Bible proves systematic theology is wrong and it always promotes itself as right. Calvinism, Arminianism, all these isms of men of Christian doctrines that have tried to come up with a way to outline what the scriptures teach in their minds by comparing men's philosophies and in trying to incorporate it into the text of scripture, wrong. We get our ideas from the text. We don't try to put our ideas into the texts of scripture. I'm going to point out that reasoning in a few minutes, but let's continue here. Verse number one, Bible says, came to pass when man began to multiply upon the face of the earth, daughters were born unto them. So mankind continues to procreate and multiply after Adam and Eve were kicked out of that garden of Eden because of their sin. Again, God is a gracious God, merciful. He has still allowed mankind to continue to exist. And I'm thankful because I'm standing here before you today. Verse 2, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair and they took them wives of all which they chose. Now, we're not going to get into this, but I do encourage you to visit our Sunday school from last Sunday's service here at church because you will learn that uh, the, son, the sons of God throughout your Bible are a reference to the angels. That's correct. And specifically, the Old Testament, uh, the, word, the title or the terms the sons of God refers to the angels. So yes, the Bible does teach some very, very uh, unique and phenomenal uh, teachings and doctrines that may blow your mind away. But again, when you consider men's lusts of today, pedophilia, bestiality, it doesn't really make me think anything out of the ordinary of what the records of Scripture teach, like angels having sex with human uh, women, and therefore their offspring are these supernatural empowered beings, as we're going to see. Verse number three, the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, comma, for that he also is flesh. So apparently these angels had a form or a body of flesh, obviously, in which they were able and capable of impregnating human women. We're not getting into that tonight, but let's just keep reading. Yet his days shall be in 120 years. So the Lord judged to decrease the age of man in time. There were giants in the earth in those days. So we're talking about these days, the days of Noah. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So before the sons of God entered into, that is, taken upon them human women for wives, the scriptures teach that there were already physical giants on the planet. So contrary to the theory of evolution, man did not begin from a primordial soup 4.6 billion years ago, you know, small amoeba and then increased in size. Rather that God had created man and man was already physically big and we've decreased in size over time because of sin and obviously the atmospheric differences after the flood. Let's get to the main point though tonight. Verse number five, God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, I point that out for a number of reasons. The first of which, as I mentioned to you earlier, in regards to the Bible proving these suppositions wrong and the scriptures correct, when you consider the God of the Bible and his characteristics as it pertains to his knowledge, as it pertains to these uh, various things that we uh, can think of in regards to, well, I thought God knows everything. How did God create people that he knew would sin? And that's where I trust more the Bible than my feelings or what I've been taught over time. And I say that to say this, that it appears to me that the text of Scripture 
uh, teaches that obviously God has chosen to limit his knowledge within his own prerogative in order to maintain his holiness. We've already talked about that in our Sunday school. You can look back in our uh, past video broadcasts. But go back with me to Genesis chapter 1 and you'll see what I'm talking about. Look at what the scriptures tell us here in Genesis chapter number 1. And let's go all the way to the end of the verse there in the first chapter of God's word. The Bible says here in verse number 31, God saw everything that he had made and behold, present tense, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So tell me, friend, argue with the Bible, not me. Genesis 131, chronologically speaking, let's just say it's right here. Everything is good in my sight and he's, he's I'm resting. You know, that's God. He's, man, I, I made everything good. It's very good. If God knows all things before they come to pass, according to Calvinism and all these presuppositions of theologies, he would have then already known. Hence, the scriptures would be a contradictory presentation of revelation as given to us if just hundreds of years later, he felt bad for what he made good. If he already knew ahead of time that it would be bad, he would be just trying to cover his own feelings or perceptions of the future of foreknowledge if that's true. So stick to the scriptures. Stay with me. Go back to Genesis chapter number 5. It appears as if it became bad. And it appears as if God then made the judgments that he made upon the earth in regards to the judgment to come. Look at what the Bible says in verse number 5. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. I'm going to show you, friends, some New Testament doctrine that lines up exactly with what God has clearly described that lies within the heart of all mankind. I'm going to show you two places of Scripture that literally teach us the very same thing, but for the sake of time, I'll show you one, and then you can cross-reference the other one later. This, the Bible tells us in Jeremiah chapter number 17, this is a very famous verse that a lot of folks like to quote. I'll show you here. Jeremiah 17, verse number 8. <clears throat> I'm sorry, not, uh, uh, not, not verse number 8. Verse number 9. Jeremiah 17, verse number 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. God said, your heart is my heart, desperately wicked. He told us that our human forefathers, their thoughts were only evil continually. So, yes, God has it within his own right to judge because of what he sees is wrong and contrary to his own character. So we're going to talk about why does God judge? Because eventually man became sinful and then, I mean, sorry, sinners after disobeying God and then that nature passed upon all of us. So who can know that desperate heart? Well, of course, God does. He sees the heart, verse 10. I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Throughout the Bible, you're going to see God speak to various prophets and tell you very similar things that he searches the hearts, he tries the hearts, he, he searches and tries the reins of hearts, and he will reward the works or the deeds or the fruit of man's doing. Look up to the Bible here in verse in uh, the book of um, Ecclesiastes. I believe, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, not Ecclesiastes. It's in the book of Psalm here. Let's see here if I can search it up uh, quickly here, if I can locate it properly here. This, this verse was not on my notes, but it came to mind in regards to uh, what we're talking about here this evening. Uh, nope, it's not there. Let's just see here. Let me see here. Man upright. I believe it's in the Psalms. Give me a couple of minutes here, friend, and we'll look it up together. Thankfully, we have a Bible software. Uh, let's see here. If I can yeah, look it up here. There it is. Okay, here it is. It is in Ecclesiastes 7.29. Okay, praise the Lord. Okay, so look at this scripture here, and it lines up in, with our principle or our, our, our emphasis of tonight's study. The Bible tells us in Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29, Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. So again, we didn't start out with an only evil heart continually. 
you and I progressively became evil and wicked in his sight because of temptations, the world around us. Eventually, as information becomes available to your mind, be it from God and the light given to you or Satan and whatever he wants to offer you through the worldly temptations, you seek out those things. Your heart begins to lust after those things. So hence, eventually, you're going to become a wicked sinner in the holy eyes of the holy God. Now, two places in the New Testament I'd like to share with you that lines up with Genesis chapter number 6. And that is this, and that's going to be in Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7. Matthew chapter 15 and Mark chapter 7. Like I said, they're very similar in its wording, so I'll give you Mark 7. You can read that in verses 18 through 23, but I'll look it up here this evening uh, with us, starting in Matthew 15 in verse number 11. Jesus said, Not that which goeth into the mouth defileth a man, but that which cometh out of the mouth, this defileth a man. So earlier they were just asking him about the washing of hands and certain uh, Jewish uh, commandments that these uh, Jews of the day that were arguing with Jesus said, hey, that is what makes somebody defiled. In other words, a sinner, because they didn't do this, wash their hands before they ate. And of course, Jesus being God, manifest in the flesh, corrects them because he sees the real problem with sinners. And it's not that which is outside, it's something that's inside. And we're going to talk about that. Then came his disciples and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? Oh, so sad. Jesus offends people. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. <laughs> How about that? Keep going. Verse 16. He said, Are you also yet without understanding? Do not ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought. But those things which proceed out of the mouth come, are you ready now? Come forth from the heart. And they defile the man. Look at what your Savior said. Sorry about that. These little uh, tabs keep opening up here. Jesus Christ, the God of the Bible who died for your sins on that cross, was buried and rose again the third day, says to you and I today what your problem is and what my problem is again it's not the government it's not your wife it's not your husband it's not your supervisor it's not the guy or girl you hate at work every other day it's not the people driving around you it's not the skin shade color of your skin tone and the problems thereof it's not the history of america back in the 40s and 1800s or my forefathers in mexico no 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 he says that the problem with mankind is the heart he told Jeremiah to tell the Israelites a long time ago, that heart is deceitfully wicked above all things. Above all things in existence, that heart is the problem, friend. And he says that the thoughts that come out of your mind, they first start here when you think about them. For out of the heart, look at what the Lord says here, proceed evil thoughts. Genesis 6, the heart of man was only evil continually, so out of the heart of the man, thoughts of murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. So you say, Brother Carlos, so what are you trying to say? Why does God, event, why does he, why does God or the Bible teach that God judges sinners? Because of your heart. Your heart is sinful and wicked before him. He's good and he's holy. He didn't create you to do the things you want to do. He created you to do the things that he's purposed for you to do that will bring him glory. But you got to understand his character. you you got to align with that. you got to align your life with his life. He's holy. He wants you to be holy. He's pure. He wants you to be pure. He's right. He wants you to be right. But the middle thing that's going to hold you back from doing that is the heart. The heart. So let's go back to Genesis 6 verse 5. God saw the wickedness in the earth and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that he hath made man on the earth and it grieved him at his heart. Wow. First time. First mention in the Holy Bible. Genesis 6, verse number 6. God has a heart and his heart can be saddened just like your heart can be saddened when you see wicked things taking place on the planet that doesn't bring you pleasure. You see, friend, you and I are made in God's image. We have a knowledge of good and evil. Unfortunately, evil, because again, Adam disobeyed God, but 
we have an understanding of right and wrong. So your own conscience bears witness with the existence of God and judgment. How about that? You just don't like when you are told what you're doing is wrong because of pride. Again, the heart doesn't want to be convinced of its evil. But nevertheless, again, God said, and again, again, according to the Bible, I'm not, I'm not trying to bring my systems of theology into the text. I'm going to grab it from the text. He said, I should not have made man. So let's take that for a spin here. If God supposedly predestinated all things before the foundation of existence, he already knew ahead of time who would and who wouldn't. He already has a foreknowledge of all X, Y through Z. Why does the scripture tell you and I that God repented of making man if he chose to make man knowing that man would fall? Hence, he at some point felt bad, although progressive revelation tells us later he did, but in the beginning he didn't. I'm a Bible believer. I'm just going to stick with the text. That's what I can defend. I can't defend presuppositions of man. Verse 7, the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the earth, for it repenteth me that I have made them. Sad, but it's true. God is holy. He's the creator. He can judge his creation at will. He has the right to do it. He's the creator. You can't argue with God. If we are not found upholding his standards of what he has established as universal laws for which the universe is to operate by, as he's given the creature free will, he's going to judge it. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. When you cross-reference your Bible later with the book of Hebrews chapter 11, you will learn by progressive revelation that the reason why Noah was a just and perfect and a right man in God's sight was by faith. You can read that in Hebrews 11, 6, and 7, and so on. <clears throat> Let's go down to verse 11. The earth also was corrupt before God. So not just mankind, animal kind, the creeping thing kind, and the fowl kind were corrupt, but the earth, that is the planet, the land, was defiled. How did the land become defiled, and why did God want to judge it? We're going to find out. Keep going. The earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. Notice that the earth as an inanimate object does not fill itself with violence. Dirt doesn't do destruction to other dirt or trees, etc. It's another living substance upon the earth which defiles it and hence it becomes filled with violence. And that existence is you and I, mankind. We defile God's earth. We are the defilers of the land. Hence, we're going to see that Sin it can become so corrupt in God's sight in which he has this cup, so to speak, and you can read about this in Revelation, but for tonight's, uh, this, uh, tonight's um, uh, teaching of understanding, I'll just give you this as an example. He has a cup in his hand, and that cup will eventually be filled to the brim of his forbearance of nations and peoples on the earth in which their son can become so violently wicked in his sight that he will pour out that judgment upon the land. And that's exactly what we're going to see. And before we end, I'm going to make application that if the United States of America does not repent itself soon of its sin before God, that is the unbeliever, the homosexual sodomite, the pedophile, the adulterer, the fornicator, the disobedient child, the porn watcher, the drug abuser, all of those sinners that are sinning in this land, this part of the earth, the Lord's judgment is going to come soon, friend, to a sit near you. So you better find out before the end of this message of how you could escape the judgment that is to come upon the earth all around us one of these days. According to God's word, I'm going to show you how you would be able to escape before it does come to pass because, again, God is a gracious God. Verse number 8, you can find that out. Verse 12, God looked upon the earth. Again, I like the Bible. God didn't know this at a time. He, uh, time progresses. He looked upon the earth, behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. Now look at that. How did it happen to the earth? Upon the earth. King James Bible, that's why you need that Bible. The flesh corrupted it upon the earth. Do you see that? God said unto Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them that is man, mankind. And of course, the, uh, the sons of God 
coming into the daughters of men, and their offspring, all that flesh, according to God, has become corrupt, and is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Leviticus chapter number 18. Leviticus chapter 18. Now you say, Brother Carlos, this is all the Old Testament. I'm a Christian, you know. I'm not under the law, but under grace. Oh, foolish Christian you are for not studying your Bible. Romans 15, 4 tells you that all these things were written aforetime for our learning. 2 Timothy 3, 16 tells you that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof. 2 Timothy 2, 15 tells you, Christian fool, to study to rightly divide. And ultimately, that Bible tells me in 1 Corinthians 2, 13 that I am to compare spiritual things with spiritual. So before you start getting all religiously legalistic on me by saying Old Testament, New Testament, no, no, no. Bible-based preaching. Let's get some understanding from the Bible, the fullness of the counsel. Verse 1. The Lord said unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. We know who he's talking to. We know that God gave the law to the nation of Israel, um, specifically, that is, uh, just unto them. The law of Moses was not given for any other Gentile people upon the, upon the, the planet. And this law was to govern them while they lived in the land of Canaan. So keep going. Verse 3, after the doings, that is the works or the deeds of the land of Egypt, listen carefully, wherein ye dwelt shall ye not do. The people of Egypt, the Gentiles down there, they were doing things in God's eyes that were wicked, evil, and he said, don't do what they did back there where you were. Keep that in mind. After the doings of the land of Canaan. Whether I bring you, not only back there, fool, but over there in front of you, those, those Canaanites, they are doing things that he does not like, he does not approve of. Hence, he's going to judge because their sin is doing something to merit it. Hence, his forbearance, remember the cup, it's getting, it's getting more, it's getting more. And then eventually, one day, that thing is going to overfill. He's going to pour that judgment out. So imagine all this time the Canaanites were living there just as a, a natural people group, the Hittites, the Hivites. God knew them. He knew that those people existed, but he's going to use his people, the Hebrews, to bring the judgment upon them for their sin. And all that time he forbeared them as just human beings upon the planet. And eventually, like we will find out later on in Revelation, that he's going to do all, for all peoples upon the planet in the future. He tells the Jews in verse 4, You shall do my judgments and keep my ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. He just simply tells the Jew, You better obey my word, my voice. Do what I'm commanding you to do. Don't do what your flesh wants to do or what the world does. That's a side application for you and I, Christian. Don't argue with God. If God says, Do this, do it. Don't do this, don't do it. Don't follow your false God, Satan, you know, from whom you were delivered. Don't go back to the world from your past, be it gangs, drugs, fornication, alcohol. And you know that ahead of you, that temptation for you yet. Don't be doing that. Don't even, don't even look that way because he says, I'm God. That, I just want you to keep that in mind as we move forward. Verse number <clears throat> 6 through 19, the Lord covers uh, the nakedness in which these Hebrews could defile themselves by uncovering family members, uh, friends, etc., uh, by attempting to, again, sex or sexual relations and disrespect upon that. You can read all about that in verses 6 or 19, pretty detailed. Verse number 19, Also thou shalt not approach unto a woman to uncover her nakedness as long as she is put apart for her uncleanness. Verse 20, Moreover thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. Remember what Jesus said, that out of the heart proceedeth evil thoughts, thoughts of adulteries. Remember what God saw back there in Genesis 6, that the heart of man was only evil continually. What was taking place in the days of Noah is going to forever take place until sin is completely eradicated from existence. But it's not going to happen until that heart change, because only the heart is what's going to either uh, set you free by trusting in Christ or keep you in bondage by uh, desiring to live in your sin. But God's law, not man's law, God's law says, do not commit adultery. That's going to defile you. We're going to see that God told, uh, or he tells the Hebrews here through Moses, that one of the reasons, one of the reasons that the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Egyptians was defiled was because of adultery. 
United States of America, modern day application. Adultery is happening rampantly in our nation. Our land is defiled. Verse 21. Thou shalt not lie. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech. Neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. The Lord did not want the Jew to offer their children as uh, sacrifices to appease the false gods of the Gentiles, the pagan, the heathen, and much like he does not want them to destroy and kill an innocent child's life, the application for Americans or anybody living in this land is don't destroy and kill innocent children. And you know what I'm talking about, abortion. And I know I've heard many a Christian say, you know, all oh, they, they liken this verse to abortion and obviously them killing and obviously as a, as a, as a thing for Satan. All I can tell you is what Jesus said that that Lucifer, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning, John 8, 44. Wherever murderous thoughts are, Satan is behind. So if people murder their innocent children in the womb without any reason, obviously there is no reason, but if they do that, God says that defiles the land. So now up to date, there have been more babies murdered than any world war combined, more than the members of the Holocaust, although that was sad, World War II, although that was sad, World War I, Vietnam, uh, the war in Iraq, the war in Korea, all those wars combined does not come close to how many babies have been murdered. God said that defiles the land. The United States needs to wake up. Verse number 22, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. You see, men have a natural understanding that uh, they've been manufactured with certain parts. The women doesn't. There's only one way to plug my TV into the wall. For those of you who understand what I'm saying, there was a socket. It needs to go into the hole. It works out naturally. The socket doesn't plug into the socket. I don't need to teach you this. I think you understand. I don't need to have a science degree. God said don't do it. He didn't create man naturally to lie with man or woman to lie with woman. That's a lust that birthed in your heart when you went against the God-given knowledge in your conscience. But Satan and all these invisible temptations of influences were telling you, yep, you're right. Go off with your feelings, whatever makes you happy. But God says that homosexuality and sodomy defiles the land. United States of America, they approved uh, homosexual marriages federally from the Obama administration, defiled the land on a federal law status. The state of California passed it. My state is defiled according to the Bible text. All nations of the earth that practice homosexuality and uplift it, defiled, and yes, even in God's physical blessed land given to the Jew there in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv of Israel, they have the largest per capita homosexual march on the planet. That's why God calls them Sodom in the book of Revelation spiritually because they're, they're going to be wicked in the last days. Keep going. Third twenty three. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Now notice what God is doing. He's warning the Jews about the practices of the Egyptians and the Canaanites, the Gentiles, He's telling them, this is the people that live without me, without God, without revelation. These people that are given over to their desires and their lustful hearts. And one of those horrible things that a man did was bestiality. Sex with animals. Disgusting, you say, Brother Carlos. How can anybody think of that? Well, friend, pedophilia has been accepted. And before you know it, bestiality, mark my words, is going to be introduced into your public school textbooks. Just like I just posted an article today that had over 130 views of homosexuality is going to become a requirement to be taught in history books for all children in public schools nationally. Eventually, your children is going to be taught that bestiality is okay to do. I'm telling you, friend, this land is defiled. They're going to need to repent. Here it is, verse number 24. Defile not yourselves in any of these things. Remember the doings earlier in the chapter for in all these things the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you. And the land is defiled, therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it, and the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. How about that? What defiles the land? Sin, who operates, projects, and emits the sin upon the earth. Sinners, people with lust in their hearts that don't get a hold on it because they're rejecting God and giving in to the God of this world, Satan, 
who say, God, we want to do what we want. We don't want to do what you want. And as a matter of result, what are they going to do? They're going to merit the judgment of God because their sin defiles the land. The land is defiled because of their sin, and that's why God judges sinners. How sad, friend, that our sin defiles the land. Verse 27, all these abominations, God calls it, have the men of the land done which were before you, and the land is defiled, that the land spew not you out also, he warns the Jew, when you defiled it, as it spewed out the nations that were before you. For whosoever, you like Bible, are you ready for it, uh, whoever you are watching online, not just the Jew, <laughs> whosoever now, come on now, you know, you've heard it, John 3, 16, Gentile Jew, planet earth, listen up inhabitants, Whosoever shall commit any of these abominations, even the souls that commit them shall be cut off from among their people. And then God tells them, keep my word, essentially, and don't defile yourselves, verse 30. Do me a favor. Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles quickly for sake of time. Let's see here. Let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to the book of Ephesians 5 and Colossians chapter number 3. Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. These are the biblical reasons of God's judgment that is going to come upon this planet because God hath made man upright, but man has sought out many inventions. Your sin and my sin defile his earth. He's going to eventually destroy it. I'm going to show you because it be, it's going to become so defiled and wicked, he's just going to create new heavens and new earth. So it's not carbon dioxide, tree hug in California. It's not my smog that's causing pollution in the universe. It's your sin. Without moving any further, I don't mean to keep going off tangents, but I posted on my Facebook church page the little Kanye West rant uh, that I completely agree with when he said that the government is not going to free you, Trump's not going to free you, the police are not going to free you. When you stop watching pornography, when you stop committing adultery, when you stop sinning against God, freedom comes. I love how he said that because that's the truth. That's the truth. Man is enslaved to his sin. Sin is what enslaves a man. Who can set the man free from his sin? Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. Verse 5 of Ephesians, uh, I'm sorry, verse 3 of Ephesians chapter 5. But fornication, by the way, he's writing to Christians. Listen up now. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. So just like the Jews back there in Leviticus that God said, hey, I took you out of that land of the Egyptians, you know, those Egyptians that defiled it because of all their sins and all their debauchery, and I'm going to take you into Canaan, that promised land, but yeah, they're doing the same thing, you know, there are abominations before me. Christian, sinner, Jew or Gentile, you are caught up in fornication, drug addiction, depression, uh, you know, all these sins against God, and he took you out of that, and now he's warning you, don't act like that. You're now my child. Verse 4, neither filthiness nor foolish talking or jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger, no unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. That's the warning for the Christian who desires to continue to live like the unbeliever they were before or the world around them. Verse number six, let no man deceive you with vain words because for because of these things, I apologize, cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. So scripture, scripture, study to show myself approved, rightly divine the word of God. I want to understand God. Why does your judgment come? Because the land's defiled. Why is the land defiled, O God? Because of their sin. Well, what kind of sin? Uncleanliness covetousness, idolatry, fornication, adultery, thefts, and all these things, and for these things sake, the wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. That's why God's wrath was against me. That's why God's wrath was against you if you are a Christian. But that's why God's wrath is against you. For those of you who are listening who are not a Christian, and you're arguing with God, and you keep fighting with God, and you keep wrestling with your conscience, I want to do right, but I don't because this makes me feel good, living in a homosexual relationship, being disobedient to my parents, and you're arguing with God. If I were you, friend, I would just repent and say, God, you're right, I'm wrong, you have the power, I don't, Lord, would you save me a sinner so I can escape your wrath to come? 
Colossians chapter number 3. Again, I shared this in our last Sunday service, but it merits uh, repetition for tonight's study. Colossians 3, very similar. Verse number 5, being written to the Christians, listen now, mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Notice the wording. Upon the earth. What do we talk about? Genesis 6. They corrupted themselves upon the earth. They filled the earth with violence through them. So while you, sinner who was saved by grace, Christian, are living on the earth, your vessel, God says, he wants you to destroy those thoughts that defile you before you manifest it out physically. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. The Bible says because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the world. The question I have for you today, friend, is who's your daddy? Who's your daddy? Is it God? Well, the God of the Bible says you can only be his child if you have faith in Jesus, Galatians 3.26. Or is it Satan? Naturally, your disposition God, because of sin, 1 John 3.10, John 8.44, here's a good way that you can test yourself, friend, to see who your God is. Examine your heart. Ask yourself, what are your passions? What brings you interest? You know, those things that motivate you to do what you do, the lust, the thoughts of your heart, your imaginations. Is it good? Is it in line with Scripture? Is it godly? Is it pure? Is it holy? Then most likely, that's your God. But if it's self, if it's fornication, if it's evil, homosexuality, lying, living in a life of sin, then most likely your God is Satan. But then you have the Christian, the, the person in the middle, the person who uh, used to be an unbeliever but became an unbeliever. If your life continues to persist, you may be saved. You have the new man in you, but you're living like the old man who was back in the land of oppression from that old God. So you need to listen up. Let's turn our Bibles to Romans chapter 5, and then we'll close with Revelation chapter number 21 and 22. Romans 5. You say, Brother Carlos, I tuned in thinking that I was going to hear some positive words. Brother, these are positive words. These are righteous words. These are words that are going to save your soul because these are not vain words. You see, I'm a Bible believer, and I preach the Bible because that's what's going to change you. It's not my feelings it's not a church denomination or a pastor or my favorite Google minister. No, no, no. What does God say about it? And if I line up myself with God, I'll be okay. If I go against what God says, I will be wrong. He'll be justified when he judges me against my own thoughts. Romans 5. Verse 1 says, Therefore, again, being written to Christians, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier, we just read in Ephesians 3 and Colossians chapter, I'm sorry, Ephesians 5 and Colossians chapter 3 that for these things sake, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. You and I, friend, were not at peace with God before we received Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Just like God's wrath was against the Canaanites, the Hittites, the people in the Bible that, you know, they argue and they scoff at God by saying, oh, look at God, he's so evil, he killed people because, you know, he just wanted to kill people. No, no, there was a reason, and he's right to do it as the creator. The only way that you and I can obtain peace with God is not through our religious church uh, denomination or membership or water baptism, your good works, your feelings. No, 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 your, your, your positive meditations don't do a dang thing for you. The only one who can bring Peace between you and your maker is the mediator, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Go down with me to verse number 6. For when we were yet without strength, now this is Paul the Apostle, he's a Christian and writing to Christians, but he was just telling them, hey, before this conversion took place within our lives, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. So there's, there's the remedy. Wrath of God against his creatures who sin against him, but grace he's a gracious god before he judges you he's gonna offer you an opportunity of redemption salvation forgiveness there it is jesus christ for scarcely for a righteous man will one die yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die but god commanded this love toward us that's right god demonstrated love to you even though you were an unbeliever at some point and for those of you guys who are still not born again christian 
God has still demonstrated his love towards you while every day you're awake and you have an opportunity. His love is available for you to escape his anger and his wrath. So, friend, receive it. Keep reading. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God is a merciful God. God is a God of grace and peace. And he, he's demonstrated his offer to save you from your sin and to save you from the wrath that he has against you if you come to the offer of the gift of life, Jesus Christ. Much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. The remedy today, friends, to escape from the judgment of my sin that has defiled the land which I live in is Jesus Christ. Receiving him as the Bible presents him today, the sinless son of God who died on that cross for my sins. He paid the penalty and punishment. He died. But God raised him from the dead because he was a sinless being. And it would be through his mediary work as the propitiation, that is the substitute sacrifice on my behalf, because I'm not perfect, my good works can't do a dang thing for my soul. It would be through his offering God the Father would accept to justify me from my sin and therefore legally and within his own free will prerogative to choose to completely forgive me of all sins and choose to remember my sins no more because he looks to me through the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. So before that judgment comes to you, and obviously today our nation, the United States, because it's coming, God is extending his hand of mercy to all citizens who listen to my preaching today, not me as a, the only me, the mediary vessel, I'm just saying through the preaching of those scriptures, they're all Christians, and that offer of mercy and forgiveness is Jesus Christ. If you repent, friend, of your sin and you trust him and you ask him to forgive you, he will. But until you do that, friend, you're defiled and the land which you live in. Verse 10, for if when we were enemies, what? Brother Carlos, I didn't even know the Bible taught that I was even an enemy of God. I thought, you know, we were cool this whole time. You know, the man upstairs yeah, he's upstairs, all right, and he's about to kick you down to the basement of hell one day if you don't get saved. The Bible says we were enemies of God. Why? Because of these things, sin, defilement, heart, enemies. We were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not my life, not my church not my works. The only way that I can be reconciled to my God, my creator, is through his son, Jesus Christ. He's the only reason why sinners can escape the wrath to come. Revelation 21, and then we'll end with Revelation 22. Remember how earlier I talked about that this earth became so wicked and vile? We read Reve Genesis chapter 6 that he judged the earth. And I'm telling you, friend, that this earth is going to be completely filled with so much defilement that God is going to just completely destroy it, create new heaven and new earth. Here's what he said. He prophesied this a long time ago in Isaiah, but I'm going to go to the New Testament uh, reference here of Revelation 21. John the Apostle caught up to heaven, given great revelation to tell us as Christians, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Very, very far teaching from what Genesis said that uh, he's going to completely destroy all men. He's going to destroy all things, all, right? all this natural earth you see and everything they're in. All the tree huggers, there, there, there goes your vote. I don't care about the trees and the whales. They're all going to get destroyed. God's going to create something better. That's why you better get saved, fool, because you'll be right along there. Verse 4, God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, neither crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Friend, don't you want to be a part of this future with God? Don't you want to be a part of a time in which 
You will never ever sense pain anymore in your heart, wickedness, wicked thoughts. This time that pain will go away literally, physically, emotionally. Don't you long for such a peace as this? Well, before we get there physically after this comes to pass in the near future, I believe, you can have that today through Jesus Christ. You can have that peace. Keep going. He that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Colossians said, Let no man deceive you with vain words. The Bible's right. If you just let God be true, everybody else a liar. Keep going down here. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, you know, like we read back there in Leviticus, Colossians, Ephesians, Whoremongers, I read that in my New Testament. Sorcerers, read that in my Old Testament. Idolaters, read that in both Testaments. And all liars, psh, all over that Bible, shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. The land has become defiled, friend. You're part of that problem. Your heart and your lust that war against God and in your mind. The only one that can give you the power to escape that judgment and that wrath and can free you from those thoughts is Jesus Christ. One day when he comes back for this church, takes us out before he pours out wrath on the earth for the great tribulation that we as Bible-believing Christians know as uh, Daniel's 70th week, God dealing with the Jews throughout all this time in the rebellion, Jesus comes back, he sets up the kingdom in Jerusalem for a thousand years. People will still die, the Lord will still judge, until this happens, when Jesus creates new heavens and new earth. But look at what he said. Who's going to be a part of that? Not the unbelieving, not the liars, not the homosexual sodomites. So you can march all as much, <laughs> march all day long, fool, for however long you want, because one day you're going to be taken out. Adulterers, disobedient children, all that sin in God's eyes, not going to be a part of that new heaven and new earth. Revelation 22, the last chapter, and we'll close. Verse number one, he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the midst of the street of it, and either, on either side of the river, was there a, the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse. There is right now, but there won't be one day. But the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and his servants shall serve him. And they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no night there. And they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. And he said unto me, These sayings are faithful and true. Two times God says, my Bible's right. My, my Bible's true. It's faithful. It's going to come to pass. Listen up. Look at what I did in the past. This is what I'm going to do in the future. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done. Behold, Jesus says, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. You know what? The Lord said, he, he's going to call me blessed if we keep what he's told us, teach it, preach it unto his coming. Verse 8, And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I had heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. Then saith he unto me, See thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book. Worship God for all you false religious people that want to worship angels and everything but God. And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. This thing is at hand. I mean, it's, it's right here, God says. I know you say, but Brother Carlos, it's been 2,000 years. But again, according to God's sight, from his vantage point, from the eternal, it's about to happen. So you better get ready. For, you better get saved, friend, from this wrath to come. Are you ready for some positive encouragement from the Bible? He that is unjust. This is the last book that God gave mankind, the last words that God wants you to know. Not the supposed prophet that you like to listen to. Not the supposed apostle or apostles, prophetess. They're all false. Don't listen to them. There's no such thing. Listen to the Bible. These are faithful words. Their words are not. Listen to this. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. 
He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Jeremiah 17, 9 and um, what we, what we read earlier, it's there, 9 and 10. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. I'm a born-again Christian. God has already told me my destiny future. That's why I don't worry. I don't worry about the politics in the United States. I don't worry about the governments. I don't worry about the, the, the supposed conspiracy of COVID and all these silly political affairs of this life because I know my future. God is going to clean house. He's going to destroy the earth and the heavens. He's going to create new heavens and new earth. Beautiful, just joyous paradise of endless bliss of holiness, righteousness, glory of God all over the place. No more need for the sun. No more need for the night. No time. No seas. Righteousness, holiness, no more pain, no more sorrow. That's my home. I've escaped the wrath of God to come because I've received the offering, the peace offering, so to speak, God made for me, Jesus. If you reject God, your sin is what defiles you. I just proved it to you. Your sin is destruction to come upon this planet. I just showed that. And this is what he says before we end tonight. For without, King James Bible or for simply outside. Outside of this future destiny, friend, listen, are dogs. Not dogs like physical, you know, woohoo, dogs, figurative speaking here. These, this is a description of people. You can read that and do a study. And sorcerers, and whoremongers, and murderers, and idolaters, and whosoever maketh and loveth and maketh a lie. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So, friend, according to the Jesus of the Bible, it is my responsibility and duty as a minister of God's word, as a Christian man, as a preacher, pastor, teacher, to just simply pass along what Jesus told John to write for the churches to preach and teach if churches are not teaching the words of Jesus, it's because they're speaking vain words. They're trying to people please. They don't want to tell you the truth. They hurt your feelings. But friend, Jesus is going to hurt you a lot more than my words are if you reject them. Remember what he said? That outside or outside of this future home are all these sinners that practice these sinful things. His wrath is going to be upon him. He's going to cast them into a lake of fire. That could be you. If you're watching all and if you're not saved, you keep fooling against God. You keep messing against that conscience he gave you and you want to keep living out the lust of your heart, friend. If I were you, I would consider Jesus, what he has given us in the revelation of the Bible and us as Christians, the responsibility to preach and teach these words. This land is defiled because of sin. The judgment of God is going to come upon the United States one day, upon Jerusalem one day, upon the nations of the world. And he will rule over this world one day with a rod of iron, he is going to let fools know who's in charge one day. You ain't going to be protesting during his reign. It's not like our gracious American government that allows murderers out there to go protest, kill innocent children and people because of their supposed propaganda of the skin shade color tone propaganda. No, no, no. You try to mess against him, he will take you out. You can read all about Jesus reigning uh, with a rod of iron. But at the end of that thing... He's going to raise your body from the dead and he's going to raise your soul and reunite it. And he's going to talk to you about all your sins. And he's going to prove to you without a shadow of a doubt, this is why you've sinned. This is why you've defiled. This is why my wrath, you have no, you have no excuse. You, so you don't want me. You, you want to keep living in a homosexual relationship. You want to keep lying against me. You want to keep making a fool out of yourself before me. Okay, there's your home right over there. There's the lake of fire. It's going to burn forever and you're going to be a part of that if you don't repent today, friend, and ask Jesus Christ to save you. So what defiles the land? Sin. Who are, uh, where does sin originate? My heart. Who can set the heart free? Jesus Christ. Who can help me to have peace with God? Jesus Christ. Who can give me an entirely new uh, start to life, so to speak, as many of our 
Gentile friends say, oh, he's going to start a new beginning, Jesus Christ. But if you keep rejecting him, the Lord Jesus told you, you want to be unjust? Okay, be unjust. Want to be foolish? Be foolish. But for those of you who want to be wise and righteous, you need to remain because he's going to come back to reward us according to our works. Hope that message challenged you today, friend. Hope that you consider the Jesus of the Bible to save you from your sin because he's going to come, friend, soon to a sitter near you to talk to you about it one of these days. So I'm saved. Hope you get saved. So, Father, we thank you for this Bible study. Lord God, this Bible has a lot of truth in it. Lord, people don't want to hear, but I just pray that people did have ears to hear and eyes to see, God, the things taught from your mouth, the things taught from your scriptures, your truths, God, not mine, but yours, God. You're a holy God and a righteous God, and in your heaven there is no wickedness. Lord, I pray for the mercy of your judgment upon this nation. The United States, my land, Lord, many of the people have defiled themselves against you. They want homosexuality. They want abortion. They want transgenderism. They want evolution. They want Satan as their God. Lord, you told us in Romans 1, you're going to give them over to that reprobate mind. We as the Christians, Lord, in this land, plead your mercy, Lord. Lord, take us home, Lord. We look for you to come for us, Lord, in the clouds. We look for the blessed hope. We look for you to take us home, Lord, before that judgment comes, Lord. But until then, have mercy, Lord, on this nation. Lord, do what you need to do, Lord, to, to wake up the minds of the people of this land, Lord. We also pray for the salvation and peace of Jerusalem. Lord, remember the promise you made with Abraham, Lord. We just ask that all these prophecies we read in this book, Lord, will come to pass swiftly, just like you said, Lord. And I uh, just ask for your grace and mercy, Lord. We thank you for your Bible. All of it is good, Lord. Help us to have a desire for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for tuning in for a positive word to make a better you. No, 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 fool. A better Christian, holy Christian, a, and a Christian that's obedient, okay? All right, friends, Brother Carlos, tuning out here from Simple Faith Baptist. Thanks for tuning in. Hope to see you guys Saturday. We're going to go so in 3 o'clock, and Sunday church service will be right back here. For any further questions, comments, please reach out, okay? The Lord bless you.